so hello and welcome to another lecture in our glycan age lecture series where we will explore the mind full of glycans and give you an insight into the importance of glycans for the neurobiological processes in our brain our today's lecture is dr thomas Klarich. he graduated from the university of adelaide australia in 2005 and obtained a PhD from the School of Molecular and Biomedical Science at the same institution in 2012. He worked as a postdoctoral researcher on stroke research program, where he used rodent models of stroke to investigate the effectiveness of stem cell therapy. He was awarded a New Fell Pro postdoctoral fellowship as a part of Marie Curie funding to work in Genos on the human neuroglycan project where he investigated N-glycosylation in the human brain. In 2018, he received a Fulbright Fellowship and went on a postdoctoral training at the Yale University School of Medicine, where he investigated transcriptional control of mouse neurodevelopment. As of 2020, he is once again in Genos, where he is applying his expertise in glycan analysis to investigate key research questions at the cutting edge of neuroglycobiology. So with great pleasure, I leave you to my dearest colleague, Tomislav Klaric. Enjoy. Thank you, Julia, for the introduction. And welcome everyone to the next lecture in our series. Uh, thank you for tuning in from wherever you may be. So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. Uh, let's get straight into it. So today's talk will be about glycans, uh, but it'll be slightly different from a different perspective. So up to now, you've been mainly hearing about uh, glycosylation of IgG uh, and its uh, use in the glycan H test. Today, we'll be talking about mainly uh, brain and glycosylation, which is slightly different. So we'll go into the differences between the two uh, in a little while. But before we do that, we'll have just a quick recap about some basics of glycobiology uh, to refresh your memory or for perhaps people that didn't see the previous lectures, just to introduce those basic concepts, for example, the structure of N-glycans and so on. And uh, towards the end, we will touch on something which does have direct relevance to glycan age, and that is the way in which various neurological or psychiatric disorders affect uh, glycosylation of IgG, which I think uh, was a question that came up in one of the previous lectures. So I hope that this will address that. And I don't know if that person is here again with us today, but um, there was obviously interest in that particular aspect. So we'll touch on that as well. So just to refresh, um, glycans are one of the four fundamental building blocks of cells and therefore of life, uh, but they're often one of the, the more forgotten molecules. Much more attention is paid to the other ones which are you know, uh, well understood and have been researched for much longer. So nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, we know a lot about them. Uh, glycans less so, uh, but uh, interestingly, glycans are probably the most promiscuous of, of these four types of molecules. And in fact, they can modify each of the other three by uh, binding to them and thus forming either glycolipids, glycoproteins, or even glycoRNA, which was recently also discovered. Uh, and in this way, they modify their their structure and their function. So although they're important, they're often neglected. Um, and there are many different kinds of uh, glycans, uh, as we said in the previous slide, but today we'll just be focusing on glycans that are attached to proteins. Uh, and even within this subclass, so we're not looking at glycolipids or glycoRNAs, but even within uh, the domain of glycoproteins, even here, there are different uh, 
subtypes of glycans. For example, there are N-linked, O-linked, there are uh, glycosaminoglycans, also known as GAGs. But again, we'll keep it simple today. We'll just talk about one particular type of N-glycan, and that's N-glycans, which are attached to asparagine residues of glycoproteins. Not all asparagine res residues, but particular ones that have a consensus uh, glycosylation site. Um, so what do we know about the structure of these N-glycans? Well, they have this core sequence. Uh, so three mannose is attached to these two N-acetylglucosamines on the right-hand side, that's the reducing end. And then they can be variously elaborated and decorated uh, on these antenna uh, on, on the left-hand side. So they form chains which can be branched. Uh, so they're, they're complex oligosaccharides, so made up of uh, these different building blocks. Uh, you can think of them as Lego blocks. We have them here in different colors. It's not so important that you know what they all are. They're just different monosaccharides, but the order is important because that determines the structure of the glycan and then hence its properties and also its function. So now that we've covered the basics, uh, since you already, I assume, know a little bit about glycosylation of IgG, since this was the topic of previous talks, uh, I'll now just in this slide uh, do a compare and contrast with uh, brain and glycosylation, because they're quite different. So we need to get a few things straight before we dive into uh, the brain and glyco. Here I should also define a term which I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with, but glycone uh, essentially uh, is the set of all glycans in a particular sample. So essentially glycone is to glycans what the genome is to genes. So you can think of it that way. So when we're talking about glycan age, uh, here we're talking about the end glycans released from a single purified glycoprotein, which is of course IgG. Whereas when we're looking at the brain and glycome, we're looking at the total sum. So all the end glycans uh, that are released from all of the glycoproteins in that particular sample. So we're talking about thousands of different glycoproteins. Okay, so we trim them all off and we look at them in bulk as a whole. And that's what we call the end glycome. Now, uh, analysis of IgG and glycosylation is relatively routine. Uh, it's well established. It can be done quickly in a high throughput manner. And as a result, there are many, many studies on this. And this has been going on for decades. And these are primarily human studies because of course it's relatively straightforward to take blood and then isolate the IgG and perform an analysis. By contrast, uh, analysis of the brain and glycome is much more complicated. Uh, methods are not so well established. Uh, it's definitely not high throughput. Uh, we're talking, you know, uh, tens of samples, maybe a hundred. That's a lot for, for this type of study. Whereas for IgG, there are cohorts, you know, in the thousands, you know, four or 5,000 is not uncommon. Uh, so as a result, uh, there is much less data out there about what's going on in the brain with regards to end glycosylation. Also, logically, uh, it's much harder to get access to brain tissue, particularly human brain tissue. So most of these are animal studies done in animal models, and we have to extrapolate the data uh, to humans or you know, make use of whatever post-mortem tissue we can to generate human data. But the coverage is, is not as good, obviously, as, as uh, with IgG. And what hopefully you know by now is that uh, we know that the IgG in glycome is very dynamic. It changes in response to various factors, external factors, uh, so it can be influenced by, you've heard in the previous talks, things like lifestyle interventions, exercise, diet, hormones even, age, of course, is the basis of the glycan age test, various medications. But this is exactly what makes uh, 
you know, IgG glycosylation is such a promising biomarker is that it responds and changes and adapts to what's going on and to uh, various external stimuli. So what about the brain? Well, uh, as I said, less is known about it. And up till now, kind of the thinking has been that it's slightly less dynamic, or I should say a bit more stable, a bit more uh, robust, or has a bit more inertia. Uh, but more and more evidence is building that perhaps it's not quite so uh, stagnant and that perhaps it is a bit more dynamic than we first thought. Perhaps not as dynamic as uh, IgG and glycosylation, but hopefully as I take you through the talk, you'll see by the time we get to the end that there are various factors, both internal and external, that can impact uh, brain glycosylation. So we'll, we'll address each of those. Uh, but here, first, I just wanted to visually uh, get the point across about how much more complicated uh, brain glycosylation is. So here I've, I've put both uh, profiles up to compare them. So you can see, hopefully, that the one on the right, which is the brain and glycon profile, a typical profile, uh, is uh, much more busy, uh, has many more structures. You can see it has 46 glycan peaks compared to the 24 that are typically analyzed uh, in the IgG and glycon. So that's one aspect. It has you know, many more structures, but that's not the extent uh, of the difference. As well as that, uh, there's much more diversity of structures, different types of structures that are not found on IgG, for example. So in IgG, you have a maximum of two antenna, uh, whereas in the brain, things can get a bit more complicated. We can have tri or even tetra antenna glycans. Uh, there are different classes which are not really present in IgG. For example, oligomanos and glycans, they actually constitute a large proportion of the brain and glyco, uh, whereas in IgG, they're minimal, practically not even present. Uh, and there are a few other differences, structural differences in the way that different monosaccharides are linked, etc., which produce some brain-specific in glycans. So yeah, we are talking about similar things, but they're not exactly the same. So I just didn't want people to you know, equate the two uh, and, and get confused as we go along. Uh, and so one thing which contributes to the added complexity and diversity, which as I mentioned, is we're looking at a whole uh, you know, swath of proteins here, the whole glycoproteome at once. Uh, and here's where I'll introduce another concept which maybe was not introduced in previous lectures because it's not relevant to IgG. Uh, and that is this uh, concept of the glycocalyx. So what is that? Well, that's the term we use to describe this fuzzy outer coating that uh, is ubiquitous on all living cells. And it's the covering on the cell membrane, which is composed of sugars, essentially, of glycans. Uh, so glycans that are on lipids and proteins as well. So transmembrane proteins on the external surface, so the surface that faces the outside world, uh, mainly we have all the glycans pointing outwards. And we have some beautiful electron micrographs here, which show that very nicely. So it looks kind of like this forest. It's often referred to as a forest. It's very dense, uh, so lots and lots of sugars. Uh, so the image on the top left, that's actually a cross section of an artery or a blood vessel. And you can see that facing the, the lumen, the internal uh, portion where the blood flows, you can nicely see the glycocalyx. Uh, uh, and here is a close up on the right. So when we're talking about the brain and glycome, we are enzymatically cleaving off a lot of these glycans and analyzing them. So you can see it's you know a, a completely different order of magnitude of complexity as compared to looking at one single glycoprotein. <clears throat> so 
uh, now that we have talked about that, why is the brain and glycome important? Well, uh, I mean, the glycocalyx is important for every cell. Uh, and that's why it's present in all domains of life from bacteria to mammalian cells, even viruses. The viral envelope uh, you know, contains glycoproteins, for example, the spike protein on COVID, which is a hot topic now, that's a glycoprotein. So basically anything, uh, all cells and even viruses, they have these glycoproteins on the outside because they play a functional role uh, in basically any time the cell is dealing with the outside world. And that's no different in the brain. Okay, so uh, the glycocalyx comes into play anytime you know, two cells are in contact, when there's cell-cell communication, when the cell is interacting with its environment, with the extracellular matrix, which is also full of glycoproteins. Uh, host pathogen interactions all occur on the, on the glycocalyx. So the first thing that a pathogen encounters when it tries to invade a host cell is the glycocalyx. So it has to navigate this and usually does that via receptors which recognize uh, particular structures on the host cell. So specifically turning to the brain now and, and what functions does the glycocalyx play there? Well, similarly, anything that involves the cell interacting with the outside world. So specifically, uh, it's been demonstrated that N-glycans play integral roles in normal brain function and development. And they're included in virtually all neurobiological processes. Here I've put a few on the slide as examples, but I could have put many more. Like I said, virtually all uh, neurobiological processes depend on this. But for example, here we have neural cell adhesion. Uh, and by the same token, that also relates to migration as well, cell migration, because that's simply the lack of adhesion. Uh, neuride outgrowth, when uh, neurons have to sprout the uh, axons and dendrites, these new neurites have to navigate through the extracellular matrix, and they do that largely via glycans. Axon targeting, Similarly, when the growth cone uh, is being extended and trying to find its target, it has to navigate its way through all the other different cells till it finds its, uh, its you know, target. This is also done by glycans. Once it reaches its target cell, it has to form the synapse. So the two cell membranes have to marry up and form a functional synapse. So all, the, all of these processes, the maturation, synaptic plasticity, all of these depend on, on glycan interactions between cells. So now that we've demonstrated the importance of the brain and glycome, uh, now I wanna get to the, the critical part of the talk, and this will be the bulk of the presentation, the various ways uh, and the different factors that impact the brain and glycome and modify it. So uh, you'll see that it's not a static uh, phenomenon at all. And the first thing I want to talk about is neurodevelopment. So of course, we know this is a very dynamic period where many things are changing, you know, new cell types are being formed. Uh, there's a lot of cell division, progenitor cells are dividing, giving rise to neurons and other different cell types They have to migrate get to where they need to be and they have to make connections. Uh, so a lot is happening. And so it's not surprising that the, the end glycome of the brain changes drastically throughout this period. So in this study, we focused on one region of the brain. We focused on the neocortex and we compared the total end glycome profile of the so newborn rats, so neonates, so 24 hours after birth with adults. So we look at the same brain region. And uh, what we found was that there are drastic changes in the composition of the end glycome, which are summarized here in this figure. Uh, so one thing we see is a huge decrease in the proportion of silylated end glycans, 
Uh, and what could that tell us about what's going on? Well, uh, you know, if we refer to what I just mentioned about the different things that are going on, uh, I mean, we are lacking some uh, you know, functional data to, to confirm this, but we can try to maybe uh, hypothesize based on what we know is occurring in the brain at that time. So uh, since other studies have shown that increased silic acid content on the cell surface promotes migration, uh, we can interpret this uh, reduction that happens uh, in adults as downregulation of this uh, silic acid because it's probably no longer necessary. It's more important to have this uh, during development when cells are actively migrating, you know, neuron blasts and newly born neurons have to get to where they need to be. Uh, so outside of neurobiology, it's been demonstrated as well in the field of cancer research. Uh, when cancer cells metastasize, they upregulate silic acid content. So something about having more silic acid on the cell surface aids in uh, migration of cells. So then it makes sense in this context that this is switched off in the adult brain, which is a much more static environment. Cells are no longer dividing or migrating so much. So perhaps there's not really any need for that anymore. The second big change we noticed was this increase in truncated N-glycans, which are simply shorter forms that don't have these extended antenna that are typical of, of other N-glycans. So why, why could this be? Well, we can get a clue from that by looking at uh, uh, different studies. For example, this one uh, from Ishii et al. demonstrated that myelin is very rich in truncated and glycans. And again, that makes sense uh, in the context of these results, since uh, at postnatal day one, our first time point, at this stage of development, myelination has not yet begun. And of course, comparing that to the adult brain where you know, it's highly myelinated. So we have, that's one of the biggest changes that occurs actually, that we get you know, bulk myelination of most of the axons. So perhaps that's uh, resulting in this change in the N-glycom profile. Uh, thirdly, uh, when we look at oligomannose content, so it was interesting that there wasn't really a change in total oligomannose content between neonates and adults, always around 25%. But if we break that down a bit further and drill deeper uh, and look at the different oligomanos subtypes, because there are different forms of oligomanos chains of different length, from M5, the shortest ones, to M9, which have nine manos residues, they're the longest ones, the biggest ones. When we break it down like this, then we saw a huge difference in uh, the proportions of these different oligomanos subtypes between neonates and adults. So in neonates, we have predominantly these larger forms. So M8 and M9, they constitute over 50% of total oligomanos content. Whereas in the adults, it's a completely different story. Uh, the script is flipped basically. And we see predominantly these shorter forms, M5 and M6. So what could be going on here? Well, uh, it turns out that synapses are rich in these small oligomanos forms. And again, that plays in nicely with, with our results, considering that again, the synapses are not yet uh, developed at the neonatal stage that we looked at, but in the adult, they're fully formed. So we would expect uh, that since we have uh, enrichment of synapses now, that is probably being reflected in the total end glycome in this change in oligomanos content. So what does all this tell us? Uh, what's the bottom line? Well, it tells us that N-glycan synthesis uh, in the rat neocortex is fundamentally different at different stages of neurodevelopment. And following on from that, <clears throat> that probably means that different processing pathways are active at different stages. And uh, finally, uh, we can see that uh, by looking at the N-glycome and interpreting the results in their biological context, uh, 
it can actually give us a readout about the current structural and functional state of the brain. So the N-glycome matches the needs of that particular point in time, <clears throat> whether it's the neonate brain or the adult brain. So in a similar way that we use glycosylation of IgG as a readout or a biomarker, let's say, uh, this tells us changes in brain glycosylation also give us clues about the underlying biology, the neurobiology of what's happening in the brain. So that's neurodevelopment. What about, oh, actually one more slide before we get to that. Um, this is a more recent work from our lab. It's, it's not published yet. Um, but here we looked at human brain development uh, with uh, the specific question of, uh, you know, having seen these changes in the rat brain, we wanted to ask whether we see similar things occurring during human brain development. In other words, are these changes in N-glycosylation conserved across mammals, which would indicate it's probably something very important? Or perhaps on the other hand, are there some possibly human specific changes in uh, N-glycosylation happening in the human brain, which can maybe give us insights about uh, the differences you know, and, what, and what makes human brain development unique. Uh, now, the setup for this study was a little bit different. We, instead of looking at one region, we compared four different brain regions. So the dorsal uh, frontal hippocampus, uh, the hippocampus, uh, pardon, uh, the dorsal frontal cortex, the hippocampus, the striatum, and the cerebellum. Uh, we wanted to see whether actually, you know, there are region-specific differences as well, uh, because we know each brain region has its own specific function. And of course, we know that uh, the brain and glycomes tied in with this. So maybe uh, the functional differences can be explained by differences in the glycosylation profile. And so when we examined uh, the global and glycosylation profile of each brain region at both time points, what we found was uh, actually that all the fetal samples tended to cluster together here in, in red, regardless of the brain region, right? Uh, and we compare this to the adult brain where we got some segregation according to the brain region. You can see at the top, all the uh, cerebellum samples from the adult cluster together, while the other three regions formed a separate cluster. So this was kind of interesting to us because uh, it demonstrates that as neurodevelopment proceeds, uh, we get this uh, dynamic shift and sort of a diversification in the N-glycone profile across different brain regions. Okay, so we start off with the fetal brain and glycone, which is, let's say, quite homogenous across all brain regions. It still hasn't matured. Uh, the different brain regions haven't reached, uh, you know, the, the, the peak maturity. They haven't distinguish themselves from one another. But uh, with time, uh, we get an increase in diversity. And uh, there, there are kind of two parallel processes happening here. We found two levels of, of maturation. One is a global maturation, which was common to all brain regions. And uh, this, in fact, was similar to what we saw in the previous rat study. So very, very similar changes happening. Decrease in silylation. Uh, we saw increase in bisecting gluconuc, uh, an increase in fucosylation as well. And this was across all brain regions, but layered on top of that, we also saw some brain region specific alterations. And now here specifically in, in the cerebellum, I mean, here we only analyzed four brain regions. So we're not sure what's going on in, in other regions as well. Perhaps they have their own different maturation pathways. But since these are the four regions we had, uh, the cerebellum was the most unique. And here we found uh, unique aspects of this maturation process. For example, a specific increase in this M6 oligomanos subtype, as well as an increase in truncated and glycans. So again, another example of dynamic changes across development. Um, Turning now to 
the other side of the spectrum, aging. What do we see there? Do we also see some changes happening uh, in the brain and glycol? We know now from the glycan age test and from the lectures we've heard, of course, the whole test is based on glycosylation of IgG changing with time, with age, with chronological age. And it turns out that uh, actually a similar thing happens in the brain too. So uh, this is not work from our group, but from other groups. And it's summarized here, uh, a whole bunch of different studies. But uh, in a nutshell, we have uh, with age a decrease in the abundance of silylated n glycans, as well as decrease in high branching n glycans. Again, similar to the changes that occur with aging in IgG. Uh, on the flip side, we see an increase in these simpler oligomanose type n glycans, which we don't see in IgG, but again, as I mentioned, uh, the, gly the glycosylation is different between the brain and IgG, and we don't actually see it oligomanous glycans all that much at all. So uh, that's quite an interesting thing. And um, you may be asking, is there any connection between the two since I've just mentioned that the changes are similar in nature? And well, yes, they are, but um, I think it's too early to jump to any conclusions yet about similarities between IgG and the brain. Yes, there are changes happening, that's been documented, but as of yet, we still don't know the functional relevance of those changes. And uh, I certainly wouldn't use, uh, for example, the term pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory or anything like that in relation to the brain and glyco. Uh, I mean, that's used for AGG and that's perfectly fine because that has been determined with functional studies and we more or less know the effect of these kind of changes in N-glycosylation on the function of IgG. With the brain and brain and glycoproteins, uh, we are not that far ahead yet. We're still a few steps behind. We don't know what these changes in glycosylation mean uh, for neurobiology. And that's number one. Number two, we are not talking about immune molecules. We're not talking about you know, an antibody. We're not talking about IgG. These are brain proteins with completely different functions. So that's something yet to be investigated. However, it is an interesting observation that changes do happen in the brain and glycome with time at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, turning now to something a little bit different, what about inflammation? Is there any data on how that affects glycosylation in the brain? And there are a couple of studies, uh, only two actually, uh, both in animal models, in rats. So in the first one here, uh, uh, they used LPS, that's lipopolysaccharide. So this is an animal model of inflammation. So they inject this LPS. So this is one of the main components of bacterial cell membranes. So injecting this kind of mimics uh, a bacterial infection and elicits an inflammatory response in the brain. And so they injected this LPS into the striatum of rats and a week later uh, compared glycosylation profiles of injected rats and control rats. And they did find some changes in, in glycosylation. Uh, so specifically they found a decrease in silylation, an increase in uh, oligomanos type in glycans. So if you remember from the previous slide, very similar changes, uh, an increase in bisecting uh, n glucosamine, uh, and a decrease in fucosylation. Uh, a similar study was done, uh, but this was a neonatal. Uh, it was actually a, a, a sepsis model, a postnatal sepsis model. So similar, they injected LPS, but into the corpus callosum, and they saw similar changes after 21 days. So, you know, 21 days, these are quite long lasting changes. Uh, we don't know how long the changes actually last, whether they are temporary, permanent, or what is the dynamics of this, how 
quickly it changes and does it revert back to normal? But uh, anyway, for those that have been paying attention, you would have noticed that these changes are very, very similar to the changes seen in the aging brain, which are also similar to the changes seen in IgG and glycosylation. So you would have heard about this concept of inflammaging uh, used uh, in relation to glycanage and IgG and so forth. So again, I would hesitate before using such a term with you know the brain and glycome, but these data are interesting and are maybe showing us that perhaps this inflammaging phenomenon uh, is global or, or you know a bit more widespread, that it's not restricted to plasma glycoproteins or blood glycoproteins. It could be functioning on a global level in all organs, including the brain. So perhaps, you know, like I said, it's still early days and we need a bit more research to, to get to the bottom of this, but perhaps a similar inflammation type phenomenon is occurring in the brain. Let's uh, move now uh, to disease and how that impacts the brain and glycol. Um, now I've got a table here, it's very busy and a lot of information and I'm not expecting you to read it all. Uh, the take home message from this slide is simply that there is now building evidence that various neurological as well as psychiatric diseases do impact brain and glycosylation. Okay, so they do alter the brain and glycome. Uh, again, for a lot of these cases, it's animal models and you know, preclinical work, and we're not sure a lot of the time about the exact uh, glycoprotein targets, or you know, is it are these changes the cause of the disease symptoms, or are they an effect of? Uh, but in any case, I'm, I'm just going to highlight a couple of examples in the next few slides, just. Uh, to bring these points home. So let's first look at uh, brain cancer because this is the, the field where there have been the most studies done and we have the most information. <clears throat> but before we uh, get into the, the specifics, I need to just quickly introduce one more concept. Uh, and that is this idea about silic acid linkage which possibly wasn't uh, discussed in previous lectures um, because uh, it, maybe it wasn't necessary. But this uh, schematic on the left, as we typically illustrate in glycans, this cartoon, it probably comes to you as no surprise that it's uh, a gross oversimplification of the actual reality. And it doesn't fully convey the complexity of, of in glycans, of course. That's impossible in two dimensions on the page. But uh, another way that we can uh, depict them is as is shown on the right with the linkages shown with these lines pointing in different directions. So these silic acids, these pink uh, diamonds on the top of the glycans, they can actually be linked to the underlying galactose residues in different ways. Uh, specifically, they can either be linked via an alpha-2-3 or an alpha-2-6 linkage, uh, respectively shown on the left with this left-leaning line, and on the right is this right-leaning line. So why, why am I bringing this up? Well, because uh, although it's the same monosaccharide, it's still silic acid, just this one minor change in the way that it's linked makes a huge difference in, uh, makes a huge difference in terms of biology, because obviously now, it makes a structurally different glycan, which recognizes different receptors and lectins and so forth. And so has, it can have vastly different effects on the function of, of the glycoprotein. Uh, in addition to these two ways of linkage, silic acids can also link to one another. So in other words, they can make long chains. Uh, and that's a special kind of and glycan epitope called polysilic acid. When they, these silic acids are linked to one another to form these long chains, they can be up to hundreds of silic acids long. And that's done via a, a, a third kind of linkage where they're linked to each other in an alpha-2-8 linkage. 
Anyway, the reason I'm bringing up all these differences, uh, I mean, the detail is not important, but I just wanted to highlight that such small changes uh, can make a big difference. And we see that uh, in relation to brain cancer, uh, that just changing the linkage completely changes, uh, you know, the, the, the nature of, of the cell and whether it's malignant or benign. So for example, these alpha-2,3 linked salic acids are upregulated in malignant gliomas. Similarly, this polysilic acid uh, form has been found to be upregulated in astrocytomas and has been actually demonstrated to facilitate tumor migration. Uh, similarly, or I should say conversely, uh, on the other hand, this alpha-2,6 linkage uh, is not found in malignant tumors. Uh, it's found in benign tumors, but when you forcibly overexpress this type of linkage in cancer cells in vitro, it inhibits their invasion in, uh, in culture. And when they're injected, uh, these cells that are overexpressing this alpha-2,6 form, when they're injected into the brain in you know, an animal uh, tumor graft model, Having these alpha-2,6 linked salic acids uh, inhibits glioma formation. So simple changes in the linkage uh, can have a big impact. Similarly, we now move to uh, branching, which uh, has also been linked to different brain cancers. So you can see here in this uh, middle schematic, so uh, on the left, we have a biantenary glycan, but they can have more antenna. So more, more of these N-acetyl glucosamines linked to the mannose residues. And in particular, this one type of antenna, it's called a beta 1-6 type of antenna. Uh, this has been associated with increased invasion in brain cancers. So uh, let's move on now to yet another disease. So in contrast to the previous a slide where extra branching was a bad thing, so it increased the invasion potential of tumor cells. It turns out in multiple sclerosis, it's the opposite actually. Uh, high branching is protective and low branching has been associated with increased demyelination in animal models of multiple sclerosis. So it was found that mice uh, that are susceptible to this uh, uh, MS model, so they have this uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. They carry some uh, mutations in different glycosyl transferases, so the enzymes which attach these, these branches onto glycans, and these mutations result in uh, a deficiency of, of branched end glycans because the enzymes don't function as, efficient, as efficiently as they should. And uh, this in turn has been associated with uh, decreased branching in these mice, and that affects the, the binding of galactins, so molecules that recognize those high branching glycans. And, and this in turn leads to hypersensitivity of T cells and destruction of the myelin. So you can see, you know, the same uh, N-glycan modification in, in some instances is good and beneficial and protective, and in other diseases, it, it's bad. So it's not quite as clear cut as with IgG. It's dependent on obviously uh, the disease context, uh, the specific glycoproteins, the, the brain region, a lot of things. So it, it's multifactorial. Lastly, I wanna just focus on one more uh, uh, brain disease, or in this case, uh, a psychiatric disorder, and that's uh, PTSD. Uh, and this is now coming back to work from our lab. Uh, now, this was very interesting for me because uh, most of the other diseases mentioned in the previous slide in that table, uh, they occur you know, spontaneously or you know, they, they, they have some genetic basis or they arise in some way, whereas uh, <clears throat> with PTSD, it requires a trigger, so an event which, which triggers it. Uh, 
So a traumatic event, of course. Uh, but, you know, and while this is an animal model of PTSD, we can look at it also another way uh, because it's actually a model of stress, okay? So we can look at the effect of stress and trauma on brain and glycosylation. And it turns out that even that can affect the way you know, our brain and glycone is, is made up. Uh, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, we saw with IgG, things like hormones affect IgG and glycosylation. Of course, with stress, we're talking about different hormones. We're talking about cortisol uh, and these stress hormones. So we didn't delve that far in this study uh, to provide a functional link between cortisol and changes in, in brain and glycosylation, but we did see changes associated with stress. So let's get into that now. Um, so in this model, uh, the rats were subjected to uh, a stressful event, a traumatic event, in this case, foot shocks. And then 26 days later, we analyzed three different brain regions, the prefrontal cortex, uh, the hippocampus, and the basolateral amygdala. And we selected these regions because they all have a demonstrated uh, involvement in development of PTSD in humans. So that's why we targeted those regions to see whether any changes might be happening there. And we analyzed uh, each of those brain regions with our typical methods, so in glycoprofiling, and we compared uh, the glycoprofiles of PTSD animals and controls. And interestingly, uh, we did observe changes, but they were quite specific. So not in all brain regions, in fact, only in the prefrontal cortex. So 26 days after trauma, we found that there was a shift from these large elaborated silylated structures towards simpler low branching structures. Uh, so again, interesting, a similar type of change as is seen in aging and as is seen in inflammation. So, you know, we're now starting to see a recurring pattern, uh, aging, inflammation, stress, they all result in similar types of changes happening in the brain and glycol. Uh, so our hypothesis, I mean, this was just uh, one study. We, we need to follow up with, you know, more detailed inv investigation about, uh, you know, the functional aspect of this. But our, our hypothesis is that uh, we, we see these changes specifically in the prefrontal cortex, and perhaps they are important in, uh, you know, the development of, of PTSD. Um, now, summing up a little bit what we've seen so far, uh, hopefully what we've seen now is that, in fact, uh, the brain and glycome is quite dynamic and various both intrinsic and extrinsic factors can impact uh, the composition of the brain and glycome, as shown here schematically, uh, <clears throat> from the intrinsic ones such as development and aging uh, to external ones like inflammation or trauma, stress, Disease, I've put here somewhere in the middle because disease is usually a combination of intrinsic and extrinsic factors. But as I mentioned, the, these three, uh, aging, inflammation, and uh, stress, as we saw, they all have a similar impact on the brain and glycogen. Uh, and while we don't yet know, you know, fully the whole story here, we, we, we need to explore this further, but we don't know the functional biological significance of this, obviously something is changing and it's probably not good because none of these three things are good really. They don't, they don't lead to good uh, outcomes. You know, usually cognitive impairment or decline in some way. But kind of the, the good news or the light at the end of the tunnel is that since we've shown that all these things can change the end glycone and it's dynamic, and that perhaps provides hope that we can change it in the other way as well. Why couldn't we, you know, flip it the other way and reduce these changes in glycosylation or reverse them in some way? Uh, that's kind of where the research is heading now. And there's no data on this yet. And uh, it's something we are working on actually, 
But obviously these kind of, let's call them positive changes would have to come from external sources, external or intrinsic factors. So one obvious thing that comes to mind is diet. Uh, and there's no data on this yet now, but actually we have a study underway on this uh, in rats where we are examining the effect of diet on brain and glycosylation. So hopefully, uh, you know, watch this space and hopefully we'll have some data on that soon. But if we could demonstrate that we can alter the, the brain and glyco through some kind of interventions, then that gives hope that we could combat some of these changes that we see that arise as a result of disease or other negative factors. Uh, okay, I'm going to change gears completely now just for the end. We're in the final couple of slides now. And I'm going to come back to IgG and glycosylation. So we're leaving the brain behind. We're going back to IgG and back to the question that I heard. I watched the video of one of the previous talks and I heard the question about, is there any association between neurological or psychiatric conditions and changes in blood IgG and glycosylation? Uh, of course, the implication of this is, can these types of conditions affect glycan age and somebody's glycan age result. And it turns out that, well, yes, there's quite a lot of data out there. And again, it's a busy slide, uh, a lot of um, information to digest. Don't bother reading it all. This is just a summary of the literature and what's known so far. And it's a bit more clear cut than with the brain. Um, in fact, most of the change that we see on the level of IgG, glycosylation, are similar across all of these types of uh, disorders. And so we've got here, for example, Alzheimer's disease, ALS, uh, dementia, depression, MS, Parkinson's disease. So the ones I've highlighted here with this uh, orange triangle, they all showed similar changes and they were all these classic pro-inflammatory changes that are associated with increased biological age when it comes to the glycan age test. So the answer is yes, uh, potentially if people uh, are suffering from some of these uh, neurological or psychiatric disorders, yes, potentially it could impact their glycan age. So if you're interpreting someone's glycan age result, I guess the take home message is to keep these things in mind because all of these will have the effect of, let's say, increasing somebody's glycan age test result score. Um, and I won't go into all of them individually. I just wanted to pull out one just as an example, and that's uh, changes in blood glycosylation in relation to multiple sclerosis, uh, because this is work done from from our group. And as you can see on the top, uh, both uh, on the level of IgG, so the purified IgG glycoprotein, on the top right panel, uh, we saw an increase in, uh, the, in, in uh, uh, so, so a decrease in core fucosylation uh, in uh, MS patients. So that correlates to a pro-inflammatory pro increase or pro-inflammatory effect of IgG and uh, an increase in these high mannose type glycans. And uh, a similar kind of trend was seen at the level of the plasma end glycum. So the total of all plasma glycoproteins that's on the top left panel, uh, we saw a decrease in salination uh, uh, and branching as well. So, the typical thing that, that is observed across many uh, autoimmune and inflammatory diseases. And on the bottom panel, they just uh, have displayed here uh, how the both the IgG and glycum and the plasma and glycum can be used to discriminate between controls and MS patients. And it turns out that just on the basis of the IgG and glycum or the plasma and glycum, uh, we were able to distinguish those two groups, the plasma and glycum had a bit more uh, power, discriminatory potential. So uh, it brings this, uh, this uh, uh, plasma and glycosylation into play as a potential biomarker of MS.
So just to uh, wrap up and sum up again, we've seen that there are similarities and differences in n glycosylation between IgG and the brain and glycol. Uh, but hopefully now you've seen that both are quite dynamic, both respond to external and intrinsic uh, factors. And hopefully I've uh, convinced you that even the brain and glycol once thought to be quite stable and, and you know, and, uh, and uh, robust is in fact quite a lot more dynamic than maybe we at first realized. Uh, and that's uh, pretty much all. Just for the final slide, I'm going to bring up a few of the remaining questions and sort of the research focus of not only our group, but of the field in general. So one thing uh, we want to get at now is, uh, you know, the functional implications. So for IgG, uh, they're known to some extent, but more work needs to be done, but especially in the context of brain and glycosylation, we are still, I would say, in the early days, you know, this is still, uh, you know, a new field. We need to get into this, but as, as I demonstrated, it's a bit more complex, a bit more involved, a bit trickier to do these types of studies. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, the second thing we want to establish is whether, you know, these glycans and these changes in brain and glycosylation are the cause or the result of disease are they contributing to, to symptoms? Are they pathogenic or are they simply, uh, let's say, a readout or a biomarker of that? That's not determined yet. And the final thing is, you know, especially for these extrinsic factors, uh, on what sort of time scale are they acting? And are they reversible? I mean, that's the key thing if we want to treat these changes and reverse them. We want to know are they long term or acute and, and without interventions how long do we need to implement them to see some sort of changes? So I think I'll stop there because we're running out of time, but um, if we do have time, uh, of course, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone might have. We do have time, but if people are short, feel free to drop off. There's a question in the chat from Joseph. Are oh. there any changes in the end glycum in the brain? Uh, uh, do they associate with menopause? Joseph, do you want to come up? I think my brain is not working at this time. Yes, just um, <laughs> hi, hi, Nick, Lena. Um, uh, yeah, just whether there are changes, just as you pointed out in the other diseases, uh, in, in in the changes in the brain, um, do you see them in menopause? Do you have any models? Uh, because we know that you know, there's definitely changes in, in, the, glyco in the IgG glycome um with menopause and we know that there's significant changes in the brain with menopause uh could that possibly be through changes in the in the uh the end glycone of the brain good question joseph uh, i do not know the answer to that um i don't know if that data is out there but i must admit i didn't really look at that too much um i will now though because you raise an interesting point and it would be Interesting, as you mentioned, we see it in IgG, um, and these changes, you know, they affect uh, all organs in women. You know, this change in menopause. Uh, I don't know. I will go and look. I can get back to you, but it would be interesting to see if if that happens. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. We also have Nina has her hand up. Yes. Uh, if you don't mind, I um. There are a couple of questions. One is, I didn't see traumatic brain injury on any of your slides. Are you aware of any research around that? I am not. No, sorry. Because that, that would be, be... Quite, a, quite a fascinating area, I would assume, just given what you've presented. Yes, I should point out, and this goes to both Joseph and yourself, you know, what I showed is not, you know, a completely exhaustive list. Uh, I did not cover every single, you know, corner of the literature uh, but you raise a good point I, I honestly do not know the answer to that question about traumatic brain injury I would have to and check into it the other things to say just when you're looking at your PTSD model I mean are you looking at talking about I guess correlation with the cortisol side of things are you looking at doing cortisol and silo transferase neuraminidase balance 
and impact on glycogen kind of trying to correlate the pathway are you what are, what are you where are you taking it further yeah well i think the first step would be to establish whether you know cortisone is uh, uh, you know directly responsible for these changes or, or different stress hormones uh, and you know that could start out simply by you know doing pure injections of that as well as you know blocking it in certain cases to see whether you know exposure to stress but blocking you know these uh, stress pathways the hpa axis and so on whether that still results in changes in end glycosylation so there's a lot to do here um, actually that project has kind of stagnated a little bit because that was done in collaboration with uh, another group which takes care of the the ptsd side we do more the glycan side and they have frozen that that's being put on ice for the moment so we that, that's on the back burner let's say uh, but that project has potential to go in lots of directions um, if anyone is keen or i'm not sure what work you're involved with maybe if you're doing that yourself we could potentially talk about extending that uh, if you have some ideas of course we're always open to collaboration uh, if people have you know and this is wider not just ptsd if people out there have different models they want to investigate we can always take care of the brain and glycosylation side from our from our side and plug it into your model to see what kind of changes are happening if that's something that interests you brilliant thank you and sorry and one more if you don't mind yeah, yeah, um, now you might not necessarily be aware of it because it's not necessarily brain specific but because you've you've um, brought up some of the brain cancer changes. So part of the work I do relates to oncology. Um, obviously, in, in oncology, more systemic cancer side, we're looking at hypercellulation in a lot of the cancers, which then facilitates metastasis and immune evasion, etc. Are you aware of any work being done on circulating tumor cells, so liquid biopsies and the glycome within those? Because to me, that would be fascinating. No, I'm not aware of that work. Uh, it's not really something I follow too closely. Um, yeah, fair enough. I, I just thought I'd ask uh, just on the off chance it came yeah. out in your research. Sorry, Thank no, you. no. Uh, I also have a question, uh, if you would allow me to. So during your studies, uh, you have been investigating a potential of stem cells as a therapy for the brain recovery after stroke. So I was wondering how efficient were they? And in your opinion, would it be possible to apply the same approach for some kind of neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease? And what would be the role of glycans on stem cells? Have you looked into that field? Good question. Uh, I'll answer the last part of that question first. No, I haven't looked at the role of glycans in that. Uh, that was work from my PhD, which feels like uh, a long time ago now. At that point, I was only vaguely aware of glycans before I you know, got into the field. <clears throat> so uh, in my PhD mentor's lab, <clears throat> that was his dream actually, to take stem cell therapy to the clinic. He was a neurologist with a focus on stroke. So that work that I did, that was uh, obviously in animal models of stroke, we administered human dental pulp stem cells. So people may not be aware, but in our teeth, there's a population of stem cells, uh, even in, in adults, that we still retain this. <clears throat> and the beauty of that is we can, you know, it's, you can use autologous transplantation. So taking your own stem cells. So, I mean, you have to take out a person's tooth, but that's much less invasive than other stuff, you know, people can live without a tooth. But so the potential there was to take out these dental pulp stem cells. Uh, you can then culture them in vitro, so grow them up and inject them back into the same person. And why do we use those stem cells? It's because they have neurogenic potential. And that was demonstrated that they can differentiate into neurons. So they come actually from the same lineage, so neural crest. Uh, they're, they're derivatives of neural crest progenitor cells in the early days of, of neural development. They give rise to this population of dental pulp stem cells in the teeth. So that was the key thing. They need to be autologous and uh, have this potential. So we did see benefit in that rat model. Uh, I have since left the lab 
and haven't really done that work in about a decade. So I kind of even stopped following. Uh, I, but as far as I know, that potential hasn't been transferred to the clinic uh, for stroke. I don't know about other diseases or, or injuries. I think they were also examining the potential for other disorders. But yeah, I'm sorry, Yuli, I'm not really that up to date with that these days. I, I would have to check and get back to you. But to answer your question, I think glycans would absolutely be involved somehow because the new cells that are injected into you know, the stroke lesion site, so the ischemic core, I mean, they have to integrate. And the point is they have to, so these stem cells, they have to differentiate into neurons. And then these newly born neurons, they have to reconnect up and find their place in, in this uh, injured brain. So this ischemic brain and, you know, functionally integrate and make synapses. And as we saw from this talk in one of the slides, glycans are involved in all those processes. So even though I, I, I don't know, I'm quite confident in saying I'm absolutely sure glycans would be involved in that somehow and maybe uh, modulating the glycans on those stem cells could you know, improve or, or uh, somehow enhance that stem cell treatment. If, if you could get that right, you know, get the glycans right, maybe that would help their integration and so forth, but I don't know for sure. Thank you. Um, maybe you should consider contacting your mentor. <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah. It's, it's too interesting. He, stem he, cells are the future of um, all sorts of yeah. fields of science. As we know, glycans, glycans are involved in everything, in absolutely everything. So yeah, yeah. <clears throat> his focus wasn't on glycans. Like most labs, actually, they kind of ignore glycans unknowingly, you know, but a lot of a lot of the effects they see are mediated through glycans. So maybe I should contact him and tell him to get into the glycans. Maybe he can Why not? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, this is um. I'm I'm Dr. Mir from Canada. Um. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I just had a uh, um. This this is all new to me. This glycoscience for the brain, um, is new to me. So excuse me if my question doesn't make sense. But I'm looking at it from a practical standpoint now. Uh, and and my interest lies in I suppose the neuroplasticity, um, with training the brain and using this parameter to help to guide. Um, if any of these interventions are actually helping um, our patients or our clients. Do you have anything that you might be able to um, help with that um, uh, insight? Well, <clears throat> uh, glycans are definitely involved in synaptic plasticity. So a lot of you know, uh, synaptic proteins, both on the presynaptic side and postsynaptic side, they're glycoproteins. Well, as we know, basically all virtually all transmembrane proteins are glycoproteins, but so they are involved. Yes, absolutely. As far as, uh, if I understand the question correctly, linking synaptic plasticity with changes in, in glycosylation, I don't know too much work about that. Um, so, but if I can just say, so, <clears throat> So with the, with the PTSD study, that was interesting to me because that demonstrated a change. And that is, you know, a change based on an experience. So a stressful experience. So we showed stress can change the brain and glycol. So that got me thinking, you know, if, that, if that's the case, maybe, you know, other experiences can also change the brain and glycol. So learning, for example, you know, that's related to synaptic plasticity. And we know there are many changes that happen there on a transcriptional level on a proteome level, I, <clears throat> pardon me. <clears throat> I don't know of data though that have looked uh, in detail about glycomic changes in relation to plasticity. But something that would interest me is for example, to put, you know, it would have to be an animal model, but put animals through some kind of learning paradigm and measure the end glycome and see does that learning result in some changes. Um, is that kind of addressing what you're yeah, asking? Sort of. Um, I suppose, you know, I'm working with some some patients with concussions and 
and uh, dementia in assessing them from a functional cognitive perspective to see the memory focus and concentration and using that information um, alongside, you know, um, uh, glycate, um, glycan age um, with those patients and then training them uh, to try to see if we can get changes and then reassessing them with those same parameters to see if we can actually get the changes um, with the interventions kind of. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Um, and but so I think this applies to everything. Uh, so for the people that are looking at, you know, getting people to do interventions to improve their glycan age. So, I mean, ostensibly that is with the aim of changing your IgG and glycosylation in a beneficial way, but hopefully, and that's kind of what I tried to get across in this talk is that it could be all related and connected. And that if you're making these changes that are improving your glycan age, it's possible, okay, you're, you're changing your IgG and glycosylation, but it's possible, and we, we have to connect the dots here and we don't have the data that we need to do more studies, but it's possible that just by doing that, you're also changing your brain in glycon in a beneficial way. So, you know, diet, exercise, and what, what you've talked about, learning, we don't know, but potentially they're affecting both IgG and brain in glycosylation. It's all just fascinating, super exciting. I, I think it's all interrelated. Yeah, it's all connected. That's my feeling. Thank you so much. No problem. Any last questions or are we close it? Yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, I think this was awesome. Thank you. Super exciting talk. Um, I wish I wasn't so tired today. But okay, uh, I'm going to close it. So thank you everybody for coming. Uh, thank you, Tomisla, for teaching. And um, yeah, uh, have a nice evening or morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.